Good day, dear viewers, and thank you very much for joining me again on the channel. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to see you here, and uh, I do appreciate the support. I do appreciate the sponsorships that encourage me to make more of these videos, despite actually being quite um, drain on resources, time resources that I could and should have been using in publications. Today we'll talk a little bit about what colloquially is known as the backbone of the vessel. And the backbone, of course, consists of uh, the keel, the stern post, the stem in with all its separate bits and pieces, and sensu stricto, also the keelson on the inside of the vessel which sandwiches the floor timbers. Since uh, we, I cannot show you an example of it on this model, I will talk only about the outer pieces. The keel really is the basis on which the vessel is uh, constructed. Um, yes, I know that's a truism, but it is a fact in more than one way. It is not just the physical stand on which the vessel is built, it also is one of the main design features, especially in the earlier periods. Everything else in a vessel is a proportion of the keel. That proportion may be uh, um, the beam, the overall length of the vessel. Everything is part of the keel. Then the scantlings or dimensions of frames of every bit and piece on board the vessel is also a proportion of the keel. So the keel truly is the starting point, both of the design, but also of the construction process of the vessel. Even the Dutch, with their original approach to shipbuilding in the 17th century, original and very, very effective, highly effective way, even they, of course, began with the laying down of the keel. So, keels, as vessels grew in size, be, uh, could no longer be built out of a single timber, so they required scarfing and lengthening with timbers. In smaller vessels in the Mediterranean and Black Sea world, single timber keels continue to be used uh, into the 19th century. As archaeology has demonstrated to us, this is because uh, of two reasons. First of all, local vessels were much smaller than the Western vessels. And second, um, equally important, large growth of uh, oak continued to be available all the way growing down to the beach in this area into the mid 19th century. There are two ways that you can scarf, that you can lengthen the keel. And the one is by vertical, using vertical scarves like this. The advantage of this scarf is that it usually is stronger. The disadvantage is that it is possible to leak. There are ways to remedy this, of course, and it was used. This vertical type of scar uh, scarf was uh, characteristic for the English and subsequently Americans. The other possibility of scarfing them was to do it horizontally, like this. And the other timber will lap over here. In this case, it is the stem that will lap it like this in a horizontal way. The Dutch in the 17th century used this type of scarf. The French used this type of uh, scarf. It, theoretically, at least, it was easier to make it uh, watertight than the other type. But on the other hand, uh, <laughs> hogging was much more of an option than with the vertical scarf. Do we have examples of this in archaeology? Oh, yes, thank you very much indeed. We do. Uh, for the English vertical scarf, Dartmouth comes to mind immediately. I've already spoken in other videos about the Dartmouth and the recording that uh, Professor Colin Martin did on her. But in his article, he is describing, giving the measurements, giving the exact assembly. So by all means, ship modelers should look into archaeological publications because they are giving you exactly the sort of information that ship modelers love to have if they are trying to build an accurate model. The other important part, the, the stern post usually consisted of um, inner and outer stern post. It could be scarred from more than one timbers. 
there is variation in how it was attached to the keel, especially in the 16th and 17th century. Iberian tradition, in essence, continued the old cog tradition of having an L-shaped timber forming the heel of the keel and the heel of the stern post, like a knee on the outside. In later periods and in English tradition, as far as we can tell from archaeology and uh, historical documents, this was not the case. Uh, keel. I really should be on top of this uh, piece. These pins are simply modeler's convention rather than anything. But in the English tradition, the stern post was usually mounted on top of the keel. Sometimes there is going to be a notch in the back, uh, in the aft end of the keel, where the heel of the stern post is going to lie. And usually there was a knee supporting this structure, and subsequently, of course, the dead wood would be built up here to create a stronger joint. The most complicated part, of course, is the stem. Partially because it is obviously of curving uh, shape. It is built of compass timber, that you say naturally curving timber. And because of this complicated shape, it had to be built up of a number of uh, separate pieces. This changes throughout history naturally. Uh, from very simple towards very complicated and back towards fairly simple uh, stems in the later period. This requires very high level of skill, and it does in uh, ship modeling too, if you choose to create a stem from separate pieces. I personally would not do it because my skill level is not that high, but that's how all it builds. So this one is completely built up of pieces. Obviously, as you can see from the background, this one was uh, built of boxwood for the Confederacy frigate. It is not the one that came with the kit. It is uh, separate. It is a replacement. The lower part where the keel and the stem geometrically are forming a connection, and this can be built up in many different ways, incidentally. But this area is known as the gripe. This is what gripes the water. This is what keeps the bow on the wind. You can see the gripe in really excessive sizes in late medieval cogs, for example, especially the flat-bottomed uh, vessels that were sailing in coastal areas, in shallow waters like the Zaldarsee, or in the canals and rivers of Europe in this period. Because this was the only thing, they did not have the depth in hold, they did not have the depth of keel to keep them uh, pointing into the wind. They required the gripe and the run of the vessel to do this job for them. Then the curvature of the stem itself is going to be built up of at least two, possibly three timbers usually with just flat scarves, simple flat scarves. Then there is going to be a full stem on the outside. Usually on the inside of the stem post, there is going to be an apron, because that is where the hood ends of the planking are really going to be nailed to. All of this is through bolted. Then there is the knee of the head that supports the bulkhead of the head, uh, over which, of course, the stem post passes. These holes over here, you see are for the gammoning, that is to say the rope that holds the bowsprit down and prevents it from lifting under the pressure of the sails of the jibs and the uh, staysails. And of course down here are the bobstay uh, holes below it. So the strange carving at the end is where the figurehead would be mounted. With this, we'll bring this short video to an end. The only Final piece that I need to mention is that on the outside of the keel, a thinner, sometimes thinner, sometimes exactly the same uh, dimension timber was added. It was known as the false keel. And obviously the task of this timber was to protect the keel. Keels were through bolted through the frames and every, usually every third to every fourth frame was through bolted from the keel upwards into the floor timber and into the keelson. More often than not, this was achieved with four lock bolts, but there are other options too, including just simple rivets. And sometimes the floor timbers are not at all through bolted to the keel. The Black Sea wrecks that I have seen so far, not one of them is this way. Many of the 
Mediterranean vessels do not have through bolting uh, their floor timbers. One final thing that I need to mention about keel stem and stern post assemblies is that although in Northwestern Europe, in our traditions, we expect them to be scarfed and to be fairly strong uh, pieces, the truth of the matter is that in the Mediterranean they could simply be butted into each other without any scarf whatsoever and the only thing that keeps them together is the planking and the whales particularly. This is how the kit and shipwreck was built, this is how the uh, Cossack vessel from the Dnipro river that my colleague Dr. Dmitry Kobalia excavated and his colleagues uh, excavated and raised donkeys years ago, they are having this construction. The the Sardinorek is uh, from Central Mediterranean is also with butting timbers. And with this, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for sponsoring the channel, for commenting and liking the videos. See you next time.